Hello, everybody. It's Phil Ball here. Um, I'm the person who's been responsible for sending you the messages about this, uh, this afternoon's session. So uh, apologies for that in some senses, because I'm sure you've had several messages from me, but it's good that so many of you have joined. Um, just a couple of things before we start. Um, if you could just mute your phones, your devices, you can cut down the background noise as much as possible. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, there is a live chat facility, there's a little chat button you'll, you'll notice up on the top right hand side. If you'd like to use that to type up your questions, what we'll do is we'll tackle the questions at the end of the session. Uh, we are going to be recording the session today as well and we will make the link available. So uh, without any further delay, I'm going to pass you across to Peter White, who's our virtualization product manager, and he'll get started. Thank you. Thanks very much, Phil, and a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, good morning or uh, good afternoon, depending upon your, your location. Uh, my name is Peter White. I've been lucky enough to be working on uh, the projects around virtualized, the virtualization of iTrinity's products. Uh, the first one which we brought to market is any one, which is no doubt why you're here today to learn a little bit more about. So I have a few slides to take you through today. We expect the session will last between about 35 and 45 minutes, depending upon the number of questions that get asked during the session. Um, so I'm just going to kick off with a few slides, and then I'm actually going to take you through our demonstration environment here and actually take you through um, the, the virtualized environment, and actually show you it um, kind of real time with, with some actual virtual machines. So. Um, First of all, just a quick recap about any one and what it is and what it looks like in the physical world. So as you can see on the screen here, it's a green box, a bright, a bright green box that sits on your desktop. Uh, it's a network emulator, or so you may have heard this term as uh, network virtualization, but it basically allows us to create different types of networks. With any one, when we uh, did the design of it, one of our uh, design principles was that it had to be easy to use. So it has a very nice, uh, elegant web GUI, uh, which I'll be taking you through later on. Um, and it also had to be designed not only for network specialists, but perhaps people who aren't that familiar with networks. They understand the concepts, but they're not kind of gurus. So it's been specifically designed from the ground up for non-network specialists, as well as those network specialists as well. So, um, a network emulator, what does it allow us to do? Well, if you take our any one unit, which we're looking at on the, on the presentation here, it allows us to take a pair of ports. Um, for example, here I've, I've highlighted port zero and one, and we can connect some things to it. So, for example, I can connect a client computer to port zero, and I can connect an application server to port one. That's all very well. But what then happens? Well, our little box of tricks, any one, can then do different things to the links between our clients and our application server. So the first thing we might want to do is to emulate different types of networks. So things like WAN or a LAN connection, different types of mobile networks, Wi-Fi, ADSL, SDSL, or satellite links. So in effect, that allows us to change the bandwidth. But we need to get a little bit sophisticated in that because, as we know, networks can behave in a number of different ways depending upon our location and the service that we're receiving. So we need to also be able to, be able to change things such as latency. And we'll look at latency in a little bit more detail later on because it can severely impact um, the applicate, your application's performance. But we can also impact, uh, inject a little bit of loss so we can start to move some packets uh, across the network as well as create some error conditions and some jitter as well. So all in all, it allows us to create various network uh, conditions, um, errors within a safe and controlled environment. And of course, in your test environments, in your own lab environments, development environments, you'll probably want to connect numerous devices to the emulator. So on the left-hand side here, it could be that you actually connect a, a switch to port zero and span out things such as a wireless access point or more than one computers or even mobile devices, tablets, those sort of devices. So you can have a many-to-many -many relationship because obviously in the real world we could potentially have lots of different servers, different application servers that we want to test with and we want to apply different conditions 
uh, different network conditions to different types of applications or to different test clients. So maybe a 3G network for an iPhone device versus a Wi-Fi uh, network for a, an iPad. So we want to allow us to be able to create those different network conditions. So that's really just giving you an overview of what, what is anyone about and what is kind of network emulation about in its most kind of simplest form. So when we've come along to virtualizing anyone, what have we actually done? So uh, today, it, it, you know, it's a bright green box. It, it sits on a desk. You can touch and feel it. It has an LCD and it has physical network ports. So these ports on the front we call emulation ports. There's also a network port on the back of the unit which we connect to the management LAN so that we can actually web in and, and, and control the emulator. So when we've come to create a virtual edition of this, we've created exactly the same or more or less exactly the same as a virtual appliance. And what that means is the operating system and the anyone uh, application software is all pre-installed for you. We have a virtualization layer, so all of the hardware components within our virtual appliance are virtualized. We have virtual CPUs, virtual disks, virtual network interface cards. Uh, and obviously, because it's a software solution, we don't have an LCD, uh, but we do have obviously things like virtual network uh, ports instead. Our first outing in terms of virtualization is around VMware. Uh, we're a VMware partner. We've worked very closely with VMware, um, and uh, I'm pleased to say we, that VMware themselves has kind of rubber stamped anyone as being uh, VMware ready. So it's been through kind of rigorous tests under the ESX server hypervisor platform to ensure that it's compatible uh, on that particular platform, and it's not going to affect, you know, adversely affect your own uh, your own environment when you put our virtual appliance on there. So to take you through an example today, I'm going to set up a demo environment um, with a few, well, a couple of requirements. Um, I'm going to set up a couple of client virtual machines. Um, I've called them client one and client two. I'm not too original with my names. Uh, client one is going to experience a 3G network and client two a 4G network. And everything else that goes across the network link is going to be unimpeded, so it won't be affected by any delays. So in terms of the ingredients, what do I need to create that environment within my virtual test environment? Uh, I need some virtual machines. So I'm going to grab a couple of Windows machines that are already set up. I need an application server, something that I can kind of test connectivity to to prove that the emulator is working and show you that real time. I also need the Anyone emulator, the virtual appliance installed. And also need some components from VMware. So I need a virtual switch. Um, which is going to be physically connected to the network so that I can control and manage uh, the Anyone through the GUI. Um, but also I'm going to have a couple of virtual switches um, which aren't going to be connected to anything. So my test environment is, is going to be actually uh, independent of any physical network connection. The only thing I need is, is a network connection to control the management GUI of Anyone. So I know this is sometimes very difficult when we're dealing with virtual environments, you know, virtual machines, virtual hardware. What, what does this actually look like? You know, what would it look like in the real world? So if we were, if we were to visualize this in the real world of anyone, we'd have a couple of clients, and in my test environment, I've, I've given them a couple of IP addresses, 0 0.100, 0 0.101. We go through a switch. Uh, obviously, this is completely virtual in VMware, so it's a virtual switch. The virtual switch is connected to port zero, and I've given this a label on my virtual environment called net zero. Um, I've given port one a label of net one, connected it to another virtual switch, which my server hangs off of over here, which is 0 0.5. So I just thought it was useful to give you a, a, a kind of an overview of what it would look like in the, in the real world, the world that we'll perhaps we'll feel a little bit more comfortable in. So that's it for PowerPoint. So this is the most tricky part of the presentation because I now need to work out how to exit PowerPoint and then get into the uh, uh, what I'm more familiar with, which is the management tools. So um, let me just load up, first of all, VMware vSphere. Now I'm using VMware's uh, vSphere fact client that you install on Windows. If you're using the uh, something like vCenter, everything I'm doing here is exactly the same. It's just a, a different interface. Uh, I know certain users, depending upon your background, will choose to use different tools. One of the reasons I like using the FAT client is because the 
Um, the pictorial views of the network is very, very good within this client, so it's very good for kind of these webinars or training sessions that we're running. So I have uh, one ESX server here. It's running uh, version 5.5 of the ESX server, um, so fairly industry standard. Uh, it's running on industry standard hardware. It's a super micro server. It's an Intel server. It's got a, uh, a couple of CPUs. Uh, so there's nothing really special about the, the actual hardware that VMware is running on. So what, what you would typically find in your own environments, if not you know, much more powerful machines than this. Within the ESX server itself, I've created some virtual machines for the purpose of today's kind of uh, virtual test environment that I need. First of all, I have a couple of client machines. Um, these are just regular Windows machines, Client 1 and Client 2 are Windows 8 uh, machines. And we're just going to do some ping uh, tests across the network um, to show you how we can affect the, um, affect the network um, using the emulator. And I have a server. And the server, just think of that as an, an endpoint that we can use for pinging. Uh, I'm not going to go into those client machines because they're, they're not really that interesting. What I will take you into, though, is the N1 emulator. I'll just show you a little bit more about it. So how did I actually get, first of all, how did I actually get this installed? So the N1 emulator is a software download. Uh, if you're interested in getting a copy yourself, if you go to the VMware uh, Solution Exchange, if you just type that into Google, you'll soon come across it. If you're already a VMware user, I'm sure you've already come across the Solution Exchange already. Uh, it's basically like an app store for the VMware community. iTrinity um, are listed on there. We have a couple of products on there. Uh, the one we're focusing on today is the emulator. We will be running sessions later on to talk around our any one network profiler as well. But if you log on there, have a look at the emulator. From here, you can find out lots of more information about it. You can also download the installation and configuration guide and actually download the virtual appliance itself. Um, from uh, from the from this particular site, as you can see there, we carry the VMware Ready uh, Accolade as well alongside it. So um, so once I've downloaded the software from there, um, uh, if you've done this before, you literally go into File, Deploy OVF Template, you pick your it took a little while to come up there, you pick your uh, file you've downloaded and you step through the, um, the vSphere client wizard to take you through to import this particular virtual machine. In our environment here, I think it took about 15, 20 minutes to import. Um, we're using kind of standard SATA drive, so not the fastest environment in, in the world, but it's, it's pretty quick to import. I won't obviously do that today in the interest of time, but uh, as you can see there, it's all kind of rubber stamp with our, our company against the uh, IVF template. So once deployed within your environment, you'll end up with an anyone emulator virtual machine. Uh, within the summary information, we can have a little a look at a little bit more of the detail behind it. Uh, and let's just go into edit the settings just to show you exactly what we, we, we have within our virtual machine. And again, following VMware's best practice, we have cut down on the number of hardware devices listed in here, so we only have the things that we absolutely need to run the virtual machine. Um, you can see that we have 8 gig of memory, a couple of CPUs, a small hard drive, um, but we also have three network adapters, which is what we run within a VMware environment. Uh, the reason we have three, the first network adapter is there for network management so that we can web in to the, um, so that we can web into anyone and actually control it, we can license it, we can start and stop emulations. And the other two network adapters, Net0, uh, connected to networks Net0 and Net1, these are what's actually used for running the emulation. So this is where we will uh, affect the network traffic. And I'm going to show you a little bit more of these in a moment. So in terms of hardware configuration, again, fairly standard type of stuff you're probably used to seeing in your own environments. I'll just cancel that for now. So just before I jump into the Any One product, I just want to show you a little bit more about the actual ESX server configuration, in particular around the network. Um, if I click on Configuration tab, and this is, this, this is one advantage of using the uh, vSphere client because it does give us this very nice view of the network here. And I'm just going to take you through this just to tell you a little bit more about what we've got set up. So again, you'll be familiar with this. Um, we have the, the default switch, vSwitch0, that gets created with every installation of ESX server. 
And here we've connected our any one emulator uh, virtual machine, the first network interface, so that we can actually manage the machine. And that's actually physically connected to a network interface. It's on a gigabit LAN on our network so that I can uh, get into it. And also so that the, uh, I can connect to vSphere using the management tools as well. What you'll also see further down is that I've connected to, or I've created two other switches. I've created vSwitch 1 and vSwitch 2. The key differentiator between these two switches, firstly, um, Client 1 and Client 2 only exist on the first, and the server exists on the second switch. The only way the traffic from Client 2 and Client 1 can get to the server is via our emulator. And as you'll notice, the emulator is connected to both switches. Uh, in the default mode of any one, we basically act as a bridge. Think of it as a bridge. We can route as well, but we, we in effect bridge. So we can bridge the traffic between these two virtual switches. You'll also notice over here, we don't actually have any physical network adapters. So this is great for, uh, for development test environments where you just want to quickly create some networks, you want to spin up your own virtual machines, um, and you want to throw in our emulator as well. It's very quick and easy to create these environments. So that's a little bit about the network configuration. If you, would, if you need to understand more about this, it's fully, document, fully documented in the installation and configuration guide available from download from the VMware site. So without further ado, let's actually now log in to the Anyone emulator. So 202.37 is the, is the management, the network management IP address of anyone. And I'm just going to log in as admin admin. And once logged in, um, it kind of lands me onto the home page. So I know some of you here today on, on the WebEx are familiar with this, your existing users of anyone. Um, and I know some other users, some other customers are on the call who use our enterprise products. So some of you have seen this before, some of you haven't. I'm going to give you a quick overview, a quick tour of anyone, and then we can actually have a look at the impact of some running emulations on our virtual machine from the start to do some things across the network. So just very quickly, the first thing is anyone comes with a number of predefined scenarios pre-built for you. And you can see that they're listed here in the list of emulations. So if I wanted to have a 4G slow, poor quality network, I can click on the scenario here and load that within the configuration, activate that very quickly. So these are all pre-built. They're all out of the box ready for you. As you create your own scenarios, you can also save those, those away in here. So as you set things up, they're very easy to recall. So on our first test today, what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to pick this special um, emulation called LAN No Impairment. Uh, and it just asks me, the, the product itself is very, very intuitive. As we go through it, it will ask us to confirm things. We can turn off some of this stuff as well. So it's just asking me here, do I want to load this particular uh, scenario into the configuration? If I just click OK, you can now see it's taken me from that first home page across to the configuration page, and you can see I'm using physical ports 0 and 1. A little, uh, a little bit about uh, any one in terms of the emulation types. Um, because I've loaded a predefined scenario, um, I've actually, within that scenario, it's a simple point-to-point -point, uh, network that it has within it. So that means there's one, net one network connection. Oh, let me just get rid of that, one network connection between um, between uh, one endpoint and another. So within this particular configuration, it's uh, within one building to another. It could be from a client computer to a server. So anything uh, anything between kind of um, uh, two, two, two endpoints. What you may choose to do um, is to have a dual hop environment where you have one network something in between, and then another network. So for example, a client computer at home using a Wi-Fi network from the Wi-Fi network maybe to a service provider. So you can build two different types of networks uh, in terms of a dual hop. So I'll just minimize that to give us a little bit more real estate on the screen. So you can see it's loaded um, a predefined configuration. It's giving us two endpoints, and these are representing um, our port zero, so this has our clients connected to it, 
and port one, which has our server connected to it. I can change these icons if I want to. I can rename them if I want to as well. So within these, uh, or between the two ports within the product, uh, within those two virtual ports, I can configure now one or more network links. And as you can see, by default, we have one network link configured for us. If I click on that network link, you can see it's been given a friendly name called LAN No Impairment. It's of LAN network type, um, but it's very easy to change this to something else if I wanted to, and we will do this in a minute. Um, it's of one gigabit, so it's excellent quality, and I have zero impedance going on across this network link. So I'm just going to click OK, and I'm just going to start that up just so that we can see what that looks like. So that's now running um, across, uh, across the emulator. So what I'll do now is just go back to uh, vSphere, and I'm hoping your WebEx sessions are keeping up with this, because WebEx can sometimes slow down. Uh, I'm just going to go into the console of the, first, um, of the first session here, of the first client. And it does take a couple of seconds just for it to come on the screen here. And you will see here I've just left a kind of a Windows command shell on the Windows desktop that we can use um, to use our kind of our friendly command called ping. So ping minus T server, and you may be able to hear me uh, tapping away on the keyboard here. And you can now see that I'm pinging the server address, which was 192.168.0.5, and I've got a perfect network environment, less than one millisecond environment. So what I'm going to try and do now, and this is always very tricky when you're using WebEx, and I'm going to try and move this around a little bit so that we can see the ping response times um, at the same time as when I make some changes to anyone. And I'm hoping um, that your screens um, are, are keeping up with this. So, um, so the first thing we want to do is perhaps change the latency. So let's go back to our configuration, go back to our configured link, drop down box appears. What I can do here is change uh, the latency. So the default behavior here is a minimum and maximum latency. So I could specify, for example, 5 and 10 milliseconds, and it will randomize the latency between 5 and 10 milliseconds on the uplink and the downlink. So I'd actually end up with a, an overall round trip time of between 10 and 20 seconds. What I'll do for the ease of use today, for the kind of ease of viewing this, I'll set the latency to five up and down, so we'll fix, sorry, we'll fix this at uh, five milliseconds overall. So five for the uplink, five for the downlink. Click on OK. If we add those two together, that will be 10 milliseconds round trip time. Just click on Update. And then what we see now is our round trip time is 10 milliseconds. So it's very easy to now start to uh, see how our applications would behave if, if we start to increase latency over a period of time. So that's the first thing we can do. We can also maybe choose to put some loss across this particular link. So the default behavior here is 20% loss. If I click on OK, go back to my emulation control, click on Update, and click on OK. I can turn off these messages, um, but I will leave them on. So now we're going to see 20% loss on the link. So what we should now see is that ping, some of these ping packets going through should now start to get lost. There we go. So again, this is typically what you're going to see across your network. If you're losing packets, um, ping will obviously tell you that, but it's really there just to demonstrate um, that we're, we're now dropping packets across the link. So at the start of the presentation, I said I was going to set up uh, a test environment. So far, I've really just shown you, you know, some, some pretty basic stuff. So, um, so within our test environment, I think the first thing we said we wanted to do was to set up a 4G connection. So I'm going to call this link, no, it wasn't, it was 3G, wasn't it? A 3G link. And I'm going to click on 3G. And we will have it as a medium and a link quality of good. And as you can see, it fills in all the bandwidth, the latency um, for me. So it's going to randomize the latency here between 27 and 35 milliseconds with a little bit of loss as well. You may be able to see as well some of the pop ups appearing, your online help appearing. Um, so it's very easy if you're not sure what things mean in the product just to click on the online help. Now what I'm going to do is this first machine here, client one, if you remember from earlier, I'm just going to come back to the command prompt here and just do an IP config just to remind us 
what IP address this is. So this is 192.168.0.100. So what I'm going to actually do now, I'm just going to expand the real estate of the GUI there. I'm going to say that the only person that's allowed to use this link is 192.168.0.100. What that means is that only traffic uh, that's destined uh, or, or that, that is um, to or from that address will be allowed to use this particular link. So we can now easily filter traffic up and down whichever link we choose. We could do that using um, TCP port numbers. So if you wanted certain applications to use certain, uh, certain links, or we could do it by VLAN numbers as well. So if you're grouping stuff together using VLAN IDs, we can also look at those tags and filter the traffic up the relevant link. So our first link is configured, 3G network, all set to go with 0.100 as being the user of that link. What we also said we wanted to do is uh, configure a second link. So what we can do now is configure this as a 4G link. And if I go down to 4G, and I can select a fast 4G, an excellent 4G. And as you can see, again, it's filled in the bandwidth and the various parameters for us. And this time, I'm going to say that 192.168.0.101, which is our client 2 machine, is allowed to use um, link 2 click on OK. And I always forget to do this. As you can see here, the link is still grayed out, and that's because I forgot to enable it. So again, it will tell you if a link is configured but not enabled, just through the simple colors on the, on the screen now. And the third link I could have as, an, have, have as a, a, a kind of a catch-all. So I could call this, I could spell catch-all. So everything else across the link. So this is great if you've got some machines that you're using other things and you don't want those machines to be affected by the network traffic, you can set these to experience zero latency across the link. And that means everything else, I won't put any restrictions in here, everything else that doesn't match here or here will fall through to our third link. So it's very easy to configure our links. So what I'll do now is go to emulation control. We'll just stop this one and we'll just uh, now go into start. Just realize I haven't got my pin going. So I need to restart my things here. So here we can see now getting a little bit different behavior now on the first link. Because as you remember, first link is 3G. If we go to client two, we should see some better response times for client number two. It may just take a little while for clients to consoles to appear on the screen here. Here we go. There we go. So let's do the same from here. And as you can see, 4G is much better than that 3G connection we were looking at. So it's very easy to uh, very easy to filter traffic up the different links. What I can also do on these links is look at the statistics for each of the links. So I can look at the, uh, and this probably is better maximized, and I'm showing you good things like graphs. So we can look at um, the bits sent, the packets sent, received, and so on and so forth for each link. So again, this can be great when you're testing applications and you want to be able to see uh, what's actually happening across the link. And these can be exported into PNG formats if you want to include in reports or, or capture that information. So it's a little bit about um, anyone kind of getting up and running. Um, and we can, you know, uh, a, a, an expert user, I guess, or a user that's familiar with the product can usually get emulations up and running within minutes um, to the point where we are today. Uh, we also have advanced configuration, uh, and again, similar to the basic configuration that we've been looking at, for each link we can may choose to change the uh, the way things happen. So, for example, when I show when I put in a loss value earlier on, the default is a random drop, which is a percentage, uh, and I was putting in I think 15%, these 15% on average of packets across across the link. We have different types of loss algorithms within the product. So for example, I could choose to drop one in every X packets. So if I put, if I change to here and put 10 in here, one out of every 10 packets would be dropped. So we've got different types of loss functions within here, as well as different types of latency. So we were using random delay. Um, we might choose to do step delay periodic. So here we can specify um, values that would allow us to start the delay at something like 5 milliseconds, then change to 10, then change to 20, 25 to 30, and then we'll reset back to 5. So that's really great when you want to kind of test 
test applications, perhaps mobile applications where the mobile device is going through different conditions where latencies might be changing. And you can ran, automatically kind of random, uh, randomly change those values in flight. And they can be performed on the uplink as well as the downlink. You can have different settings for the uplink compared to the downlink as well. So a huge number of advanced options in here. Um, um, and it's probably worth mentioning whilst I'm on the, I'm just checking time, yeah, uh, on the subject, within the appliance itself, within the settings, um, it's fully managed within the GUI. So there, there is a system console in VMware. We're used to consoles in VMware. That's where, how we live and breathe on, on VMware after all. But, um, but uh, generally within ED1, everything's performed using the GUI. So we can set up more users. I can add additional users in here. So if I wanted users to have their own emulations and not share emulations, then we could set up uh, individual users to have their own login credentials and passwords. Everything you do in terms of updating the, uh, the software, so when we bring out new releases of the products, you apply code updates or software updates, I should call them, through the GUI here. So again, very easy to update. Appliance control, you can choose to reboot or shut down the appliance, the virtual appliance using the any one emulator GUI here. We do have the VMware tools installed um, on the product as well. So you can actually shut it down directly from vCenter or through scripts or, or however you choose to shut down your environment. So again, it kind of um, uh, integrates very easily in your, into your environment. Uh, and finally, licensing as well. Obviously, we can update license keys within the products and license it. And if you do download from the VMware Solution Exchange, you will need a license key. But again, full instructions are provided within the document that, that you also download with it. If you get stuck in the product, we've already looked at the hover over help, so that's always a good starting point to give you some guidance in terms of how to uh, how to get started with it. But we also have online video tutorials. Uh, we also have help um, within within the product in terms of product manuals and documentation as well. So um, last thing um, time, I guess we have yeah we have kind of ten minutes or so less. So perhaps I'll just go back. To the environment here and just show you a little bit of something else we could do. So, um, so something that's always interested in, I mean, we've looked at ping so far, but perhaps we'll uh, just change link two to something a little bit uh, worse than a ping. So maybe we'll put that down to something like a 3G connection um, of slow network type and a good network quality. Well, actually, let's put that to an excellent network quality. So um, I'm just going to put these, these latencies down manually to something like 10 and 10. Um, and actually, maybe, maybe I should go a little bit higher to start with just to make this demonstration a little bit more interesting. So let's, let's, check, let's select a, a 4G connection with 10 milliseconds to start with. And what I'll do is just click on OK here. I'll just go back to emulation control and update uh, the settings here. So if I go, what I need to be able to do as well is show you this at the same time. So, if I now go back to my pings, you can see we've got a 20 millisecond round trip time. So kind of what we expect. I've also got a mapped network drive over here. So good old Windows Explorer. Uh, it's disconnected at the moment, so it's reconnected now. And I've got a 330 meg file here. And I'm just going to copy that down to um, the local machine here. And we'll see, see what it calculates at. So it's pretty quick here. It's 10 point yeah, megabytes per second. So let's see if we can quickly, if I'm quick enough, just go back to the configuration of link two, and let's just set this up to a much higher latency. Emulation control, update, okay. And let's see how latency now affects the copy of this file. So I haven't changed bandwidth at all. I've got all the bandwidth in the world that I need. But as you can see, latency severely affected out there, although Windows seems to be recovering quite well. Um, although, again, going back down again. So you can see the latency can, can severely affect um, application performance. And what we've actually done in the past is if we put a little bit of loss on that link as well, in fact, let's just do that. Let's, let's just do that again, see what that looks like when we put a little bit of loss on it. So I'll just keep that there for a minute. And let's go back to our configuration, link number two. Uh, let's just put 20% loss. Maybe increase the latency just by a little bit again, 35 milliseconds, and just do emulation control. And let's just replace the file, replace the file to start with. 
and see how this now gets on. Okay, so let me now go back. I didn't click on the update button, so now let's click update. And now let's see what happens. As you can see now, with a little bit of loss and higher latency, ooh, well, we've, we've broken Windows Explorer. And we've got all the bandwidth in the world. My point here is that it's not always bandwidth related. It's going to kill an application's performance. It's quite often latency. Bandwidth can sometimes be fixed quite quickly. Latency can't. So when you're testing your applications, it's always worth playing around with latency to see how, how uh, your application performs and also how it recovers when we put latency back. So, for example, if I now go back to my configuration and let's put the latency back to 10 milliseconds with 20% left, Lost. Let's see how Windows Explorer or File Explorer now handles that. Does it recover or does it now sit there and perhaps lock up? Mm, I'm not so sure. So maybe we just have to leave that and see. So um, that's uh, pretty much it for the kind of live demonstrations today. Uh, what I'd like to do is just jump back to the presentation and just finish up and just tell you a little bit more about my Trinity and what we've been up to. So that's where we got to earlier with the PowerPoint. So um, first of all, if you don't know iTrinity, we are, uh, it's pretty much our core business, we make network emulators. And we're kind of proud to um, tell the world that earlier this year we, we, we won the Network Computing Awards 2015 for Performance Testing Product of the Year. So it kind of proves our heritage, our expertise in this particular area. We have, um, network emulators for different sized environments. So uh, any one um, is, is a great, great network emulator. It allows you to create, as we've seen, virtual networks and all of those different network conditions. But if you need more complex, faster, larger networks, maybe where you want multi-tenanted environments, you want developers sharing a network emulator, then we also have larger um, uh, high performance emulators um, right up to kind of high speed 10 gig fiber ports. And they offer you the ability to create fully mesh networks, allow you to connect over 200 uh, devices to those networks, and as I said, a, a full multi tenancy environment. What, oh, there we go. And uh, just, just finally to cap there, recap here, the, the, the kind of logo slide. Um, I'm quite often asked where our network emulators used. Well, Sometimes it's easy to say where they're not used. Um, in terms of industry, we're used across everywhere. So uh, military, financial services, uh, quite big in gaming at the moment. Um, a lot going on in that area for obvious reasons because of the way games are changing. Um, we're used in healthcare. Uh, you can imagine where X-ray images are being moved around, fairly large images. How do they perform over different types of networks? We're used in managed services, so technology environments. We're used as consultancy tools. So not healthcare. So um, as you can see, a very wide range of industries we're using um, um, today, um, over 300 customers globally. So I think that was it for the presentation. I'm just going to quickly try and hook back to some of the questions that have come through. Um, first of all, I think there was a question around hypervisor support. Uh, we have started with VMware. Uh, obviously, VMware have the largest market share today. Um, VMware, um, and we're, we're obviously a VMware partner. We've worked hard with that. Will we be add, adding other hypervisors? It's something we're actively looking at. Um, Hyper-V, um, we are uh, actively looking at at the moment, um, as well as how um, some of the so also as how, how our technology could be used in cloud environments, so something like Azure, where you may have a development environment and you want to put uh, something like an AnyOne emulator. That is something we're looking at actively in the future. If you do have a requirement for a specific um, virtualized platform, please do email me because um, I'm always interested to hear what, what people are working on, whether it's Zen um, or, or other platforms. Okay, um, in terms of routing, uh, so another question um, that was asked is, can, can it act as a router? Yes, it can. Uh, I may have kind of whizzed over it earlier, but it's within uh, any one. Uh, everything that we've been looking at today has been in what we term as kind of bridged mode. It's acting like a hub. Um, but sure enough, we can give IP addresses to the individual ports themselves. So you can um, assign whatever subnets you want to either port 
and anyone will act as a uh, a network router and route between the two um, the two networks for you. So just the same as a company other router integrates into your environment into your own routing environment. Um, in terms of availability of the virtual appliance, yes, that, that the best place to download it is from the VMware solution uh, exchange, and it is available today. Just to confirm, it is available for download. So if you if you would like to try it out, that is the best place. To, um, to try it out. Uh, and finally, how, in terms of resources um, that, the, that the machine uses, um, two CPUs, eight gigabytes of RAM. The hard disk is very small indeed. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's something like 16 gigabytes, and I think we've, we've even given you the option to use uh, VMware's thin provisioning on that as well. So, um, so yeah, very, very low in terms of the Utilization. One final point on, on the VMware hardware. We do use um, uh, VMware's VMX Net3 driver. Again, we, we followed VMware's best practice guidelines when we built, built the virtual appliance, and uh, we use that because it offers high performance packet processing through the VMware, VMware's architecture in, in, in terms of what they recommend. So um, you can't change the driver types on our on our network interface cards, they must be VMX Net3. So um, on that note, I'll just go back to the PowerPoint. I'll just check that no other questions have come through, and they haven't. Uh, so finally, um, you know, please download it. Please give it a go. Um, we're happy to take feedback, uh, really welcome your feedback around the product, uh, as well as the product being used in a virtual test environment, uh, something we're really keen to understand. Uh, and if you need anything else, please email into info at itrinity.com. If you want to email me directly, that's fine, peter.white at itrinity.com. Our contact details are here, or go via the website. I guess finally, just like to really thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to uh, speaking to you soon, hopefully on the next webinar. Thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye.